28, Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Give us all great faith today, Lord, and bless our mothers with a special dose of your mighty love and great faith that we might live to please you because we know that without faith, it's impossible to please you. So be glorified now during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I want to tell you about a mother, see if you would know who, who I'm thinking of. This mother was the, tw the 25th child born out of 25 children. And then she got married at the age of 19. And she had 19 children of her own. Of these 19 children, nine of them died in infancy, including two sets of twins. Another one of her children was accidentally smothered in the night by a nurse when she was recovering from her labor and from her delivery. That's a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow and a lot of joy in motherhood. Do you know who this mother is? Well, she had two famous sons. If you don't know who I'm talking about, I think you'll know now. One of them was named John, and the other one was named Charles. And they started, or John started, the Methodist Church. And we sing many of Charles's hymns. And I'm speaking about Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley. Her organizational skills are legendary. To have so many children, it's said that she had a rotating schedule through which each of her children could spend an hour with her alone at bedtime on a designated night each of, throughout the week. So she rotated them around. Early in her life, she had vowed that she would not spend more time in leisure and amusement and entertainment than she did in prayer and the study of God's word. She, so she scheduled two hours a day to fellowship with God. Now question, how in the world do you do that with 10 little kids running all over the place? So Susanna's solution to this, to spend time with God, was to grab her Bible and go to her favorite chair. And Trish, this is how you do it with three boys, I guess. You, she threw her apron over her head and she formed some kind of a tent. And she called this her tent of meeting. And so when her apron was over her head and all of her little ankle grabbers were running around or playing, they knew that she was in communion with God. And unless there was an emergency, she was not to be interrupted. So there in the privacy of her tent, she interceded for her husband and for her children, and she got into the mysteries of the Word of God and developed a real faith in the Lord. She was a woman of great faith. So that's what our message is today. A mother's super faith. Now, where was this woman from? Where did Jesus find this great faith? So here we are. Here's a map of Canaan land, of Israel in the days of Jesus. And here's Judea. And of course, here is the heart of Judea was Jerusalem the capital city where the temple was. Was she from Jerusalem? Is this where Jesus found this great faith? No, not in Jerusalem. How about Galilee? This is where Jesus had, had been doing many miracles and doing great and mighty works and preaching throughout Galilee, going on different tours of the region. But did he find great faith in Galilee? No, it wasn't in Galilee. The Bible says that he found this great faith up in this region of Phoenicia up in this region of Tyre and Sidon. And there's only one instance in the New Testament ministry of Jesus where we see that he went to this region. 
And so here is a divine appointment of God where he meets this woman. Where, what, what was her ethnic background? Well, maybe she was Jewish and migrated up to Phoenicia. No, it says in Matthew chapter 15 where she was from. She was not of the tribe of Judah. She wasn't of the kingly tribe that Jesus was from. So Jesus wasn't showing mercy and kindness to speak to her because she was of the same blood as he. No, she wasn't even of the tribe of Ephraim, the great tribe of Joseph's seed. Joseph, the great man of Genesis. No. It says in Matthew chapter 15, a woman of Canaan. We know about Canaan. Early in their history, it says cursed be Canaan. And then in the days of Joshua, God sent the nation of Israel to bring judgment to many of the Canaanite people groups in Canaan land. So here God shows mercy to a Canaanite. You know what Canaan means, by the way? It means a, a merchandiser, a, a, a merchant, a salesperson. In other words, somebody who's just, uh, the idea of a Canaanite is somebody who's just a materialist, a secularist, no room for God in their life. That's the idea of a Canaanite. It's what the word means. So here was a woman of Canaan, but in her, Jesus finds great faith. So what is faith? I asked that question. What is faith? And I have it in your notes this morning. And I've defined faith for many years, and I've shared this before, but I believe that biblical faith, biblical faith, a Bible-believing faith, is a confidence in God. When I say confidence, I mean a deep conviction in God, an assurance in who He is, and regarding the unseen realities revealed in His Word. So our faith is in the written Word of God and in all God has revealed to us in Himself of his person through his word. And that, and our, so our faith goes in reference to what's been, happened in the past, what's present right this very moment, and the very future itself. Biblical faith is a deep assurance of the unseen realities revealed in God's word in reference to the past, the present, and future. So faith is not a fantasy. Faith is not a denial of reality. Faith believes in realities that we haven't seen in the past. I've not seen, I didn't see Jesus die on the cross, neither did you. We didn't see him, we didn't see his resurrection body, and we don't see him in heaven now. But these are all realities that we believe in because they're written in the Word of God. So faith is foundational, really, to all we hold to, all we actually ultimately do. It's really everything we do comes out of our faith. Faith is behind, and that's at the bottom of everything we ultimately say and how we behave. Now notice this woman's faith. Now why is faith vital? Why is faith important? Why does faith matter? Notice that faith grabs hold of the other grace, strength, wisdom, help, promises of God. So with faith, we grab hold of the grace we need to live by, of the promises of God. And Jesus said, oh woman, great is thy faith. Now why does faith matter? Because look at the result of her faith. Jesus says, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Now she came, her daughter had a demon. And so Jesus if you will, capitulated, he surrendered to her will. So because of her faith, Jesus does a, a mighty thing. And that is even a creative thing, I say, a creative thing. Notice that word be. He said, O woman, in verse 28, he says, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So the word be reminds me of creation. Let there be light. Let there be, God said. So Jesus is speaking as God, and he says, be it unto thee. And he does a work of creative healing in this girl's life. And the demon is exercised from her that very moment, and she is made whole. And Jesus said, be it unto thee. 
Jesus gives her. Why does faith matter? Think about this. Jesus gave to her all that she wished for, just as she asked for. Jesus gave her her desire of her heart. Faith matters. O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee. Even as thou wilt. Her will was in line with God's will for sure. So faith, O woman, great is thy faith. So I want us to look at three things this morning about this woman's great faith. And the first thing I want us to see is that great faith makes a passionate supplication. Notice her faith in her passionate supplication to the Lord. That's in verses 21 through 23. And I'll, I'll read it again. It says, Matthew 15, 21. So Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. We saw that on the map. It's in the upper region of Palestine on the sea coast of the Mediterranean Sea in, in the land of Phoenicia. It was the land, by the way, of Jezebel. This is where Jezebel was from. So this woman of Canaan was from there. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Isn't that something? So here's this woman making, a, I say, a passionate supplication. And I use that passionate, I use that word passionate carefully because it says she cried to him. That's the word that Jesus used when he spoke to Lazarus. He cried, Lazarus, come forth. That's the word Jesus said when he cried out from the cross. It is finished. It's a very passionate cry. We get our word crazy from that word. She's crying to the Lord. Now, at this point, do you know where Jesus probably is? I believe he's in a house. Now, if you go to Mark chapter 7, this miracle appears in two gospel accounts, only in Matthew and Mark. So it's in Mark, and each gospel gives important information that the other doesn't give. So it is important for us to maybe uh, compare both of the readings of these verses, of this story, miracle. Mark chapter 7, if you look at verse 24, and it tells us something Matthew doesn't tell us. So it says he went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon in Mark 7, 24, and he entered into a house and would have no man know it. So he went really for respite, for rest to this region. He didn't want anybody to know he was there. But then it says, and this is a great text, he could not be hid. Oh, he could never be hid. He'll, he always shines forth. It's like his light was shining out of the house. Somehow this Canaanite woman found out where exactly he was. And she came to him. And I believe when she was, now I'm using my, 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 my imagination, if you will, here. But I'm trying to picture the scene. I'm seeing Jesus in the house. He doesn't want anybody to know he's there. And now she's crying from outside the house. And she's crying, oh, have mercy on me, oh Lord, son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. And so she's crying out with great passion. Jesus is in the house. This kind of reminds me when we were in Grenada. When we were in Grenada, we would walk down the street with Pastor McCauley or Pastor Dennis they would just walk down the street and they would cry out to the different houses and they knew the names of the people in the house and they would say hey hello brother so and so hello sister so and so and they would come out to the window or they would come out to the door and they would say hey pastor hello pastor like that you know it was really interesting how they could do their visitation they didn't even have to knock on the door because there were no windows on the house they just cried and the people came so i i picture that it's kind of what's happening with this woman she's crying from outside she knows Jesus is in the house. And she's praying with great passion. Now, there's two things I want to just say about her passion and her prayer. Is Her prayer was coming out of a saving faith. Somehow she heard about Jesus. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Look what she knew about Jesus before she even met him that day. She heard about him, and she believed. I believe. Because look what it says in verse 24. She says, have mercy on me, O Lord. So she believes that Jesus is Lord. 
We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. So she's confessing with her mouth that Jesus is Lord. That took great faith for a woman of Canaan in that region. Not even many in Israel had believed. Not even Jesus' brothers had believed on him at this point. And yet she believes that Jesus is Lord. And not only that, but notice the fullness of her faith here. It says, O oh Lord, thou son of David. <laughs> so she understands the world is under a curse and that God has promised a seed to come into the world through, through David himself, the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and that out of Jacob would be born Judah, and out of Judah would be born David, and out of David would come forth Christ, and that the son of David would be the Messiah. She believes. Wow. So she believes Jesus is Lord, but the son of David. So she believes he's fully human, fully God, completely man. That's her faith already. Based on that verse, I say to you, I believe that someone had told her about Jesus and she believed and that's why she comes. She had a saving faith. Not only does she have a saving faith, but she has an overcoming faith because she has obstacles. She has a faith in the Lord, but she didn't, doesn't mean she doesn't have problems. She had an agonizing problem. She had an agonizing problem. What is her problem? Her daughter is vexed with a demon. And Mark even says, I believe, that she had a devil, a demon. I don't know exactly what effects this demon had in her life. Maybe depression, maybe suicide, maybe immorality. We don't know. But we, we know in other places that demons could lead people into suicidal type activities. I believe that de the devil is behind suicide. Maybe she was hurting herself, cutting herself, doing things to herself, uh, destroying herself, doing self-destructive things. She had a demon. And this was of great pain and anguish to the mother. And, and this need that the, that the daughter had became the mother's need, and this need drove her to Jesus. And isn't that true, moms? When your children has a, a need, don't you go to the Lord with it. Don't you cry out to the Lord. And so her heart of faith could not cease from calling to the Lord. She had a great problem. But notice, what does Jesus initially say here she is crying out with him did she have a good prayer did she have faith i say yes but what does jesus say to her you know what he says he answered her not a word <laughs> nothing silence crickets as they say jesus did not answer her a word so this reminds us that many times when we pray perhaps initially our prayers don't get answered right away and the Lord is going to test our perseverance in prayer. So he answers her not a word. Her prayers were met with silence, the silence of Jesus. But then it gets worse. She had to overcome a great problem, the silence of Jesus. But next, next she overcomes the rejection of the disciples. Because I think this was probably even worse for her. Now, again, in my mind's imagination, this is all Jesus is inside the house. She's crying out, Lord, have mercy on me. Oh, son of David, Jesus isn't answering. And then the disciples start telling Jesus from inside the house, as I, as I see it anyway, they start telling him, send her away, verse 23. This woman is, she's making a racket. She's annoying us. Get rid of her. So they didn't just ignore her. They instead told Jesus, get rid of her. She's getting on our nerves. You know, sometimes our prayers meet with discouragement from even other Christians. They'll say, you're praying about that? That's impossible. Why are you praying about that? That's crazy. Well, God, God can't do that. <laughs> oh, yes, God can. Oh, yes, he can. Nothing is impossible with God. What, with, what man thinks is impossible, God says, is not impossible. And if God has put a desire in your heart to pray, you pray that prayer and you keep praying it. And Jesus might be silent. And even disciples, other Christians might discourage you and might say, get rid of, get rid of her, Lord. 
don't hear that prayer, but Jesus is hearing. She crieth after us. Now, we see that she had a, a, a great prayer, a real prayer, a great need met with her. And so she had a saving faith, an overcoming faith, a great problem, met with silence and then rejection. So what is she going to do? What is she going to do? Well, this was a woman of great faith. You know what women of great faith do? They pray. They don't give up. This past week, a dear woman who had become a member of our church, many people did not know her because shortly really after coming to Heritage, she became sick to the point where she was not able to come to church. But let me tell you, when Dorothy Palmer was healthy, she never missed a service. She was so faithful and active and cooking and caring for other people and meeting the needs that other people had. Uh, she, she was just like a honey and flies would come around her and everybody loved Dorothy. Now we knew her, remember what she would always make, even though she was sick and she was she was experiencing some dementia, even as she was coming to Heritage, but she would make brownies for us. And some people say, oh, she's the lady who made brownies, remember? But Dorothy was a woman of prayer. And she had needs in her family and her children and her grandchildren and her husband. And she also cared for a, a elderly foster family who had a mental disabilities. And they were older people too. And she, she cared for them. She was just so full of energy a great woman of faith, yet she didn't see all her prayers answered, but I know God heard them all. There's another woman I'm thinking of, and Josephine, I'm so glad that Josephine was with us today, is with us today, and it's Regina Genright. Regina was a member of our church when we first started. The, she came from the Associated of the Blind. When our church started, we were on uh, 23rd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue, and there was an associated of the blind uh, just on the uh, next block or so. And, and so Regina heard me, I guess on the radio, she started coming to our church. And she, what a sweet woman of God. She had an, an unsaved husband and, and children and, and they just needed the Lord. And, and we would always pray with Regina about those things. And she would say to me that she was blind, but being blind was not one of her problems. <laughs> She had other problems and things, but she prayed and she was a woman of such faith. And then she got cancer and she was dying in the hospital. And, and I know our dear sister Josephine visited with Regina many times and was actually there like the day before that, that Regina would pass away. And Regina prayed this prayer that Josephine told me. She said, Lord, I thank you for your goodness. Think of that woman who's blind, dying of cancer, and has faith to say, Lord, thank you for your goodness. She went home to be with the Lord not, not long after that. So now think of this situation. Feel, feel a little bit of the tension here if you can. Can you enter into this with me? Here's this woman, she's come from a distance. She's crying out to Jesus, he's in the house. Jesus is not answering her. And maybe she even hears the disciples telling the Lord, Lord, send her this woman away. Maybe she hears them saying this. That's discouraging to her heart. What is she going to do? What would you do? Maybe she would think, well, I'm not getting any love here. I'm not feeling the love. I'm going home. I'm giving up. But she doesn't. She doesn't. You know what she does? And this is a woman of great faith. She breaks through and worships. And so the second thing here, we see her undeterred adoration. Undeterred, that's a good word. That means she is not going to be stopped. We need undeterred worship. In other words, nothing should keep us and stop us from getting to Jesus and worshiping him. So she breaks through the silence of Jesus she breaks through the rejection of the disciples and she falls at the feet of Jesus. But simultaneous to this, Jesus says to her something even maybe more discouraging. He tells her, 
in verse 24, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You say, what does that mean? What is Jesus telling her? Jesus says to her, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, when Jesus sent out his disciples on their preaching mission, he said in Matthew chapter 5, if you turn to Matthew chapter 5, or Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, when Jesus sent out the 12, he sent them forth and commanded them, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, there were reasons for this and probably reasons too vast. We cannot get into them all now. But simply to say that do you know what Jesus is telling her? Ex really exactly what you're reading is what he's telling her. Jesus is saying, I'm not sent to you. <laughs> I, I am sent to help the Jewish people. You are not of the Jewish people. You are a Gentile. That's what it seems that Jesus is saying. Now, that's a discouraging word. That's why I put Jesus tells her a discouraging word. So his silence is followed by like, I'm not sent here for you. Wow. That's a question for us to even ask. Did the calling of Jesus Christ include that he wasn't supposed to help a woman like that? Is, that, is Jesus unloving? Is Jesus discouraging? Is Jesus excluding her? Is there hope for this woman? Or should she just pack her bag and go home? <laughs> Again, if, if you were in her shoes, you might be tempted to just say, I tried. I tried again and again and now the third time. But you know what she does? She doesn't quit. I see this woman now going into the house, breaking through, walking into the house, and falling at the feet of Jesus. Mark 7 says that she came and fell at his feet in verse number 25. And Mark, uh, Matthew 15 says, she worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. At his feet, she's at the feet of Jesus. Now Spurgeon, and you know I love to read Spurgeon. Spurgeon, and I tried to read all of them. I couldn't read all his sermons. He has like five or six sermons. And some of the things I'm saying today do come from Spurgeon because he's so rich. Spurgeon has one sermon on this story, how to meet the doctrine of election. Really interesting. Basically, he's telling her, I'm not come here because you're not of the elect nation. And so I'm come for the elect nation, Israel. That's interesting. So how does she meet that? And many people do fear, well, what if I'm not elect? What good will believing in Jesus do? This worry is in many people's minds. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're struggling with whether you are the elect and whether God could really save you, let me ask you this question. Can you prove to me that you're not the elect? Or let me ask you this question. Why would you suppose you're not elect? How do you meet that? What if you think, I'm not sure I'm the elect. What if I'm not the elect? How do you meet that? You know what you do? You break through it and you believe. Because if you believe in Jesus, you're the elect. You break through that and you worship and become a true worshiper, a true woman and man of faith in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, you cannot prove to me that you are not the elect. But if you repent and turn to God and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, who died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead, and he's alive today, if you repent and in, in repentance and faith, turn to the Lord and receive him, you can prove you are the elect. <laughs> you can't prove you're not the elect, but you can prove if you are the elect. Make your calling and election sure, the Bible says. Now, some will say, so, Pastor, do you believe in this doctrine of election? 
The Bible says, make your calling and election sure. The Bible calls believers the elect of God. Jesus says when the Father, when Jesus comes, will he find uh, a a faith on the earth? There is an elect. I believe it because it's in the Bible. Then somebody will say, well, I didn't think, I thought you weren't a Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist. You don't have to be a you don't have to be a, a Calvinist to believe the uh, an election. Election is in the Bible. I'm not a Calvinist uh, for other reasons, but I will just say this: I believe in the absolute, complete sovereignty of God in salvation. But I believe in the absolute and complete responsibility of man to believe in Jesus Christ and and to come to Jesus Christ as an act of their will, and when they hear the word, to come to Him and respond to the word and to the convictions of the Holy Spirit in them and come to Jesus and believe. And you're responsible to believe. Nobody will be able to stand before God and say, well, God, I would have believed in you, but you didn't elect me. (laughs) You'll never find that. It will never happen. So Jesus is saying to her that he has come if you take the whole Bible into account, we'll, we'll say a little more about this in a moment. But if you take the whole Bible into account, Jesus is saying, I am come first for the nation of Israel. Now, there will be a blessing to all the other nations of the world. And Jesus is not discouraged, trying to discourage her to send her away. Jesus is testing the reality of her faith. And he is testing her. And, and let me say this about this whole matter of election. You say, can you fully explain election? No, I can't. And that's, I'm okay with that. I can't explain how Zoom works either. So I'm okay with that too. And I'm, I'm using it. Sometimes, you know, I don't know how to use it. You know, when I try to put the, put my PowerPoint up there, or whatever, it's like, bah, you know, but I, I don't understand how all this stuff works, but I use it to the best of my ability, you know, and I don't understand. And I even got a thumbs up, first thumbs up ever from Adrian. I had to say, uh, thanks, bro. I don't understand how God's, the glory of God's salvation works fully, but I know this. If I come to Jesus in true faith, believing who he is, he'll save me and he'll save you. And he will meet this woman's need too. And that's what he's going to do. Truth is always in tension. And there's always a tension, even in this matter, because we don't fully understand everything. And we say, well, how does this truth work with that truth? And how do I reconcile them completely? I say, well, there's two tracks of the, of the train here. And, and just look at those two tracks. God is sovereign. Man is responsible. We can't fully understand how it all reconciles. There's a tension to truth, but never a contradiction. Truth is always in tension, but never in contradiction. It's a good statement theolog- when you work through your theology. There's a tension in every theological truth in in some ways, but there's never a contradiction. And so she worships. Now, notice how she worships, though. And this is for you moms now, specifically moms. She breaks through in worship. And notice what she says. Very simple. She just says, Lord, help me. Now, wait a minute. Who has the need? Who has the need? The mother? Is the mother sick? Does the mother have a a personal problem? Does she have the demon? No. Who has the problem? Her daughter. But you know, this is a mother's heart at work. When a mother has a child in agony and pain, the mother embraces her children's agony and pain as her own. That's what a mother can do much better than any father also probably. I'm not trying to say negative things about dads, but there's something special about the heart of a mother to embrace the hurt and the pain of her own child's agony and say, help me because my daughter has a need. And because my daughter has a need, I have a need. There's something so beautifully unselfish about a mother. I'll never forget that day when I smashed my face against the, the concrete. I, was, I would come home for lunch every day as a boy because uh, I didn't live far from the school. I had a Stingray bicycle. It was a three-speed bicycle. And I would ride it home for lunch, and my mother would have two, you know what she had, you know what kind of sandwiches, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with red raspberry jelly. 
my friends ate grape jelly. They didn't know what they were missing by eating grape jelly on their PBJ. You, you got to try red raspberry. Anyway, she would have that for me and I would eat my lunch and then I would get on my bicycle, go back to school. And I was going back to school this afternoon, that afternoon, and I popped a wheelie. And when my front tire came down, I can still, this, I was, what, eight years old? I was in about the third grade or so. And I could still picture the front wheel of my tire hitting that rock. Because when it hit the rock, when it came down off the wheelie, it hit that rock and the, the front tire, you know, the, the wheel uh, went like that. And I went down on the pavement and I smashed my face and I killed my two front teeth. To this day, it gives me problems that I have two dead teeth and caps there. And, and I was bleeding and I went straight back home. And I met the school guard there at the, cause there was a pretty busy road that I had just crossed over. There was a school guard and he said, well, you better get home, son. So I went home and I, I went in and I'll never forget when my mom met me that day. And she looked at me cause she had fallen and killed her teeth when she was a girl. So she knew what was going on and she just hugged me and helped me. And, and just to have my mom there and her love on that day, there's nothing like the embrace of a mother when you're in deep pain. And a mother is the most unselfish person perhaps in the world. And it's a mother who often knows what's best for their children, you know? So children, listen to me. You got a mother here going to Jesus, help me, because my daughter's, you know, and maybe that daughter, she didn't see her need. Maybe she had this demon and she was just stubborn and obstinate and rebellious. Maybe it was a demon of rebellion and rejection of the Lord. And she was praying for her daughter's salvation. And so maybe this daughter didn't think she had a need. I don't know what the specific thing was, but I do know this. Parents see the needs in their children that the children don't see themselves. That's my point. And so this mother was going to the Lord, help me because my daughter has this need. I see it clear. And so Lord, help her through this. And so children know this, that your parents know your needs in a way that maybe you don't even know them and they'll pray for you in a way that you'll never be able to know. So the third thing we see about this passage of scripture is this mother's humble submission. Her humble submission. And again, I use these two words carefully because now Jesus tells her, <coughs> he's, already said, he's already said two things, or done two things that are kind of hard. He met her with silence, and then he said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now he says something else. He says, it's not meat, or it's not right or suitable, proper. It's not proper to take the children's bread and to cast them to the dogs. Wait a minute. Time out. What did Jesus just call her? Did she just get called a dog? <laughs> did you think, do you think Jesus expected that? I mean, do you think this woman expected Jesus to say that? Wait a minute. I came all the way over here. You meet me with silence. You tell me you're not, you're not sent here to help me. And now you call me a dog? Now, dogs in the East were unclean. Adult dogs were prowlers, howlers, barking, biting. They were unclean, mangy. And we've seen dogs in third world countries, right? Flea bitten, their hair's all off because they've just scratched themselves so much. This is it, it, dogs. And you go to other cultures, these cuddly little dogs that you bring into your house, they, they don't go in the house. But wait a minute, though. Jesus is not calling, saying she's an adult dog. He actually uses a diminutive word for dog. Look it up. And it's only used in this story in Matthew and Mark in the New Testament. A little dog, if you will, a puppy. Jesus is using a diminutive, two diminutives, in fact, a little dog and a little crumb. And if you look at it, it almost makes, it makes poetry in the original language. But he says, it, it is not right to take the children's bread the little, little bread, little crumbs, and cast it to the dogs. 
and to cast it to the little dogs. So in effect, what she's saying is the, the Lord is saying it's not right to take the, the, the children's bread, the children, which is Israel, which I'm coming here to help and save. I'm sent to the house of Israel and to cast it to the, to the little dogs. But you know what she does? She humbly submits to the word of God. What does she say to that? Does she say, did you just call me a dog? Does she argue with the Lord? Does she dispute with him? No. You know what she says? Look what she says. Truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. Wow. She embraces the words of Jesus. And she says, truth, Lord. And by the way, in Mark's gospel, again, comparing the, the two stories, in Mark's gospel, if you look at Mark 7, verse 27 here, there's a little phrase before Jesus says it's not right to take the children's bread and cast it to the little dogs. He said, let the children first be filled. Now that, that's kind of important, actually. Let the children, which is speaking of the Israelites, let the children first be filled. Now, what is she going to do with that? I say, again, this is a test of her faith, but she humbly submits. So I say, moms, have a humble submission to the word of God. Some things you're going to hear are going to be like, I don't understand that. We don't understand everything we read at times. I certainly don't. But yet, it's true. Whatever God says is true. So we have to say, yes, Lord, that's truth. If I don't fully understand it, or if it sounds even hard or harsh to me, I still have to say, truth, Lord. Truth. Your word is truth in every which way. Truth, Lord. So she humbly submits to the word of God. And that's a good response to every word of God, the hard words, the convicting words, the things difficult to understand. Truth, Lord. And so her response then is amazing, full of faith. She says, truth, Lord, yet the little dogs, the dogs, eat the little pieces of crumbs, the little crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now, again, no, this is beautiful. But this is what is going on here. So we see the diminutive twice. She says, the little dogs eat the little crumbs. And Jesus says to her, because you, you are willing to embrace that you are like a little dog, and you're willing to eat a little crumb, that a little crumb from Christ will suffice you and is sufficient for you, you have great faith. That's not a diminutive. That's a mega. <laughs> says, you've got mega faith. So a few things here. Number one, she submits to God's salvation plan. She knows that salvation is of the Jews. Jesus told that to the Samaritan woman. She knows that God's plan was to send the seed of Abraham to save the world. She called him the son of David. So she knows that Jesus has first come to Israel. Now in Acts chapter 3, verse 25, so it she knows that God's salvation plan is for a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, of the nation of Israel, to come and save Israel and beyond that, the world. In Acts chapter 3, verse 25 and 26, P Peter is preaching here, and he says, You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. The seed there, of course, is Jesus. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So Peter's preaching to the Jewish people in Jerusalem, and he says, unto you first. The gospel is to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So I believe this woman is submitting herself to God's salvation plan when she says, truth, Lord, that's true. And I accept that. I'm a Gentile. You know what it says of Gentiles in Ephesians chapter two? It says we're aliens. We're aliens. We're not national Israelites. We're outside the chosen nation of Israel as Gentiles. We're strangers from the covenants of promise. We, without God, we're, we have no hope. Without, we're without God in the world. Ephesians chapter 2. But you know what this woman says? She's saying basically, she says, I know I'm a Gentile known as dogs to you Jewish people. But just like a little stray puppy 
can find kindness from a small little child and maybe even brought into the house when, I'm, when the little dogs can come into the house and the children will feed the, the dogs. Children love to feed dogs, don't they? They love, I love, I still like to feed a hungry dog, but children love to feed the dogs when they come to the table. Those of you who have dogs know that you probably spoiled your dog. How many of you have spoiled dogs eating, the, eating your food from the table? And dogs are extremely loyal. You feed a dog once or twice, he's yours for life. And so she says, Lord, I'll be like one of the little dogs that eat one of your little crumbs and I'll stay right at your feet, worshiping you. Now, many people are offended by this, but the fact is God chose the nation Israel through which to send his son. And Jesus Christ came first for Israel, but also for the whole world. So she submits to God's salvation plan, but she also submits to her sinful condition. She doesn't say, I'm not a dog. I'm not. She doesn't argue against it. You know, the Bible says all of us are sinners. We can't argue against it. She doesn't say, you hurt my feelings. That's not loving of you to call me a little dog. She doesn't accuse Jesus of being unloving or unkind. She doesn't argue against what he says. She says, truth, truth, Lord. She humbly submits to her sinful condition. You know, let me just read a few verses. You don't have to turn there. Isaiah 1.5. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. If he, uh, Isaiah 64, verse 6. For we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness, you know that verse, are as filthy rags. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 1. That sin is written with a point of a diamond upon our heart. In Psalm 38, verse 4, the psalmist says, Mine iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Do you know when you realize the, the greatness of your sin, then you'll come to the Lord. You, we have to embrace that we're sinners. And as we embrace ourselves great sinners, we'll see more the greatness of our Savior. See, as long as you say, no, I'm not that great a sinner, you will never need a great Savior. You see, the Lord says this about us. All of us without Jesus Christ are lost. But the good news is he came to seek and save the lost. So embrace that you're lost. So you can embrace he came to save the lost. Don't, don't, don't say no to Jesus when he says something about our sinfulness. Embrace it and say, Lord, you came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The Lord says that we're rebels and that we're even, it says in Ephesians, you know how bad our condition is? We're dead. We're dead in trespass and sin. Embrace it. Don't say, oh, don't call me dead. I, I, I'm, I'm alive. Look at me. If you're without Jesus Christ, you're dead of the life of God. You need the life of Jesus Christ in you to give you eternal life. If you don't have the life of Jesus in you, you will not have eternal life and go to heaven when you die. You need Jesus to save you. You have to call out to him. You must realize you're a sinner, a great sinner. Somebody might say, wow, how can I love myself if I see myself as such a great sinner? Pastor Matt, you're not helping me here because you're not making me feel good about myself. <laughs> Listen, our problem isn't that we don't love ourselves. Our problem is we don't love God. And the fact is, and this is like, it, it, there's an irony here. The, the irony is, the more you see yourself as a great sinner, the more you will see the greatness of God's love, and that will make you love God. So my, real, my problem is not that I don't love myself. My problem is I love myself too much. My problem is I don't love God the way I should. And the way, one of the ways that I first realized that I, need, that I am to love God, and to love God is to realize he loved me even when I was a great sinner. He loves us so much. He took all our sins upon himself and died for them. He took all of our great sins. Can you imagine how many sins were on Jesus when he died? You know, the way to feel good about yourself? I want you to feel good about yourself. You know the way to feel good about yourself? Is to realize God loves you just the way you are. God loves you. And you can come to him right now, today, just as you are. You don't have to wait or put it off in any way. That, that God knows you. He knows your past and your present. He knows your future. And if you're saved, 
he knows us and he still accepted us. Isn't that something? And he still loves us. So that's how we feel good about ourselves is we bathe ourselves in his love. So she embraced her sinful condition. And the last thing is this here is that she embraced God's eternal purpose and she humbly submitted to God's eternal purpose. So this is truly amazing about the story that here was this woman, she came out of this region and it, you wonder how she learned or knew what she knew, but she must have known certain things because she puts herself in line with the eternal purposes of God because this is what, in effect, she's saying. Now, follow me. This is what she's saying, in effect. She's saying, Lord, I understand you were sent here for Israel, but the little dogs, the Gentiles, will also receive the promise of the seed because the seed is going to come to save Israel, but through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And I'm one of those families of the earth. All the Gentile families of the earth. So she somehow knows that God's purpose is that through Israel, the gospel will go to the world, to the Gentiles. That Abraham's seed, Jesus Christ, will bring blessing to all the families of the earth. Romans 1.16, that the gospel is the power of God to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So maybe this woman knew about Rahab of old, who was a Canaanite, who was in the line of Messiah. Or maybe she knew about Ruth of old. Remember, remember the story of Ruth? Our children learned that last week. And it talks about how Boaz commanded his servants, let fall some of the handfuls of the wheat, handfuls of purpose. It says in our, in our King James text, but the idea is let fall some of the handfuls of the wheat on the ground. And so Ruth could glean some of those uh, some of the wheat that had fallen to the ground. And that's kind of what she's saying here, that the Gentiles will glean the wheat that's fallen under the table. And just a crumb, just a crumb of Jesus Christ is enough to heal my daughter. I don't need much from you, Lord, because you're so good. You're so powerful. You're so mighty. Just a crumb from you, oh Christ, will be enough for me. And Jesus, you might call me a little dog, but you know what Jesus did for this woman? He became a worm. You might say, why did Jesus say hard things to her? You know, you know, let me tell you, friend, is that Jesus went far lower than that. Jesus became a worm and died for our sins. So as we close, look at Philippians chapter 2, please. And he died for the sins of the world. And he came for the Jew, yes. And Israel will be saved one day. I believe national Israel will come to Jesus. God's not done with Israel, but he's not done with us either as the Gentile peoples and even the Jewish peoples. There's a remnant of Jews and Gentiles who will be saved. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 says, But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. So we need mothers like this. Mothers who will pray with great passion. Mothers who will worship undeterred from any obstacle put in your way. Get to the feet of Jesus. Be like Susanna Wesley. If you got to just put an apron over your head and make a tent. But get to Jesus and then humbly submit to every word of Jesus and say, truth, Lord. Truth. Oh, we need mothers like this. Mothers who will submit to God's salvation. Submit to their own sinful condition and submit to God's eternal purpose. So I say this as I come just to the end here now. Friends, maybe you see yourself as an outsider. This woman was an outsider. She was outside the house, but she cried and she came in. So maybe you see yourself as an outsider. You can cry to the Lord and you can come in to Christ. Come in to faith. And then moms, we need you to pray. We need you to pray for our nation today. 
We need praying mothers today as never before. We need you to pray for our church. Pray for your church family. Pray for this preacher and this preacher's wife. Thank you for all your prayers for us over the years. I know you pray for us. We need our, you to pray for our deacons. We need you to pray for uh, our assistant pastor, Carmine, and our uh, assistant brother, Micah, and the ministry they're doing. We need you to pray for other members of the church. Pray, pray, pray. We need you to pray for your children because no one will pray and can understand even your children the way you do. So moms, pray. And if you're without Christ today, Come and believe. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mighty power and grace, O oh Lord. And I pray, God, today in the name of Jesus that you would give us that, this faith that this woman had, great faith, a faith that will pray with passion, a passionate supplication as this woman had, with undeterred adoration. Lord, teach us to worship you. And teach us, Lord, to humbly submit to every word that you speak. And be pleased, Lord, to even do your work of salvation today. Do your work of strengthening in every life. Do your work of providing for every need. Do your work of giving peace in the midst of all the uncertainty before us. And Lord, live in us, work in us, inhabit our praises, move through us and in us, live in us and outside and through us, Lord, and help us to grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. And when our steps are tottering and failing and our growth is often slow, have mercy on us, Lord, and give us the faith of this Canaanite woman today, O oh Lord. And as I close today in prayer, if there's anyone without Jesus, if you need Jesus today, call upon him, even praying a simple prayer like this from your heart. You're not saved by a prayer. You're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But the, the heart that believes will call out to the Lord. And you can call something like this, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a guilty sinner, worthy of death and hell. But I thank you for your love. Jesus, you died on the cross for me. You humbled yourself to the extreme to bear all my filthy, dirty sins and died for them so I don't have to die and go to hell. Thank you, Lord. I call upon you to save me now, Jesus, because I believe and know that you're alive, risen from the dead. And you said that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Lord, work your salvation, work your grace, give us faith and increase of it in Jesus' name. Amen.